Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about marriage and cohabitation. This is a fun chapter because it gets into the culture of marriage and it also gets into the institutionalization of marriage by society. So the book first breaks marriage down into two realms, the symbolic or cultural realm and then the legal realm. When we're talking about symbolic status or cultural status attached to marriage, we're talking about how marriage is a social construct. Marriage is socially constructed by individuals interacting with each other and coming up with ceremonies, formal rituals, whatever it might be attached to marriage, and then the status itself attached to that. Now, marriage itself is culturally influenced. For example, in some cultures, we can marry for love. Some cultures, they have arranged marriages. Some cultures, same-sex marriage is acceptable. Some uh, cultures, same-sex marriage is still not acceptable. So in 2015, the idea of the dynamics of what a marriage is legally and socially constituted has changed. Over time, we've seen this incredible movement by minority groups, both sex minority groups, racial minority groups, gender, sexuality, different ethnicities. And so one of these major movements led to the culminization of the Same-Sex Marriage Act in 2015, which again is recognizing that family in general and family types in general have diversified over time. And what used to be a traditional way of life and a cultural way of life has been challenged in many ways. And even if it wasn't challenged, it's just maybe we've just kind of pushed the bar or maybe not even challenged, we've just opened up our minds to all the different ways that people can interact. And again, we have to ask questions. Some of the ways we interact cause harm, but you know, having diverse family types like same-sex couples, for example, who does that actually harm? And again, I can tell you first and foremost that it does not harm the children. And then when you look at things like studies, again, your parents' sexuality has nothing to do with your actual sexuality. And so some of those arguments that are against that, hopefully you guys are recognizing are kind of futile. So, but basically a major core of this book that we've been talking about is relationships have changed, the way people interact has changed, our social construction of marriage and relationships and our conceptualization of what it should look like has changed, the script has evolved over time. And so during this epoch of our times, you know, in the 2020s, we're watching all of this unfold before our eyes because social change is happening everywhere. You know, we're seeing kind of the downfall of racism and sexism and heterosexism and we're challenging ethnocentrism and we're really looking at some of these things in society that kept people down. And again, we have to recognize that our sexuality as human beings exists along a spectrum, okay? And so for society to embrace the spectrum of sexuality, embrace the spectrum of gender identity and gender role ad adaptation and the social construction of gender and the social construction of sexuality, there's a ton of things happening in modern times. And so the book focuses on cultural shifts and it causes it calls it cultural crises and you have to ask a question is it like a negative crisis or is it just a crisis where it's a turning point or maybe it's like where a bunch of axes have come together at one time and again the movements that you're seeing today to challenge the traditional ideology and then socially construct a new way of having society and a new way of creating institutions such as the family it's just kind of changing. And I don't see the crises, you know, because crime is down by half. People are actually engaging in less sexual activity. So you're starting to see like that the more we adopt these open-minded policies, the more we kind of deconstruct these um, things that kept us you know, on the bottoms of society and opened up our doors to allowing people to just be themselves and be with who they want to and, you know, be in any type of relationship you want to as long as it doesn't cause harm has changed over time. So I'm a big critic of this idea that we're in a cultural crisis. I mean, we're watching, you know, many waves of feminist movements. We're watching the civil rights movement unfold before our eyes. And, you know, legalizing something like same-sex marriage is just, again, just continuing on what was started with John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson and, 
you know, and all the other advocates, Martin Luther King and, you know, everybody else that jumped in on the Civil Rights Act, but, you know, and then Stonewall and then the, you know, so you, you just have this wonderful culmination of all these great movements that have happened over hundreds of years in America. And it's just kind of coming to a head now. And now we're opening our minds to gender identity and how gender is infinite. And we can continuously construct new genders and identify in any which way we can. How sex, biological sex, is associated with so many factors such as genetics and chromosomes and genitalia and hormone levels and how are your hormone levels associated with your sexuality, you know, and th just a lot of new ideas that nobody's ever really considered before that we're opening our mind to today. But as we're doing this and as the family type has changed over time, and again, you know, your book talks about how initially the family was a political system. And then this kind of idea of marrying for love and companionship evolved over time. And then now in modern times, you know, why do people get married? What are the effects of divorce rates that are increasing? What are the effects of people having less children? What are the effects of people marrying less? What are the effects of people waiting later in life until they're married? Has the idea of marriage changed over time? And so, again, we're asking all these great philosophical questions and we're looking at our age as an epoch and we're comparing it to different ages and we're asking overarching questions like how has the institution of the family changed over time? Has it changed over time? How has the uh, institution of marriage changed over time? And again, has it changed over time? Are we not getting married for the same reasons that we used to get married? And the book kind of says, well, again, initially it was over politics. And then at some point, this idea of love started to enter the picture. But when did this all happen? Okay. And then your book also talks about the growing practice of uh, unmarried cohabitation, where it used to be a social taboo for people to live together, especially if they were opposite sex, you know, in a romantic relationship. And so in modern times, that's the new normal. And again, when did it become the normal to cohabitate? When did it become the normal to be divorced? And so these are just some awesome questions that we should be asking, okay? Uh, diversity, inequality, and social change. Again, diversity. Two-thirds of people that marry live together prior to getting married. And this is a brand new idea. This idea of people living together before getting married, even having children before they're getting married, and then also maybe living together without being married with children from different relationships. You know, these are all new ideas. And it introduces ideas like stepchildren and step parents. And is step a really a thing anymore? Are they really just your parents? Do we need the word step? You know, and then what do we call people that are living in our household that are part of our family, but they're not related to us by blood, but now they're our brother and our sister because, you know, our parents who had children previously got married and now they're all a big family. So we're all asking just really awesome questions about what does it mean to be a family? And what does it mean to be a family if you have two divorced parents or two same-sex parents? And does that actually change the institution of family or is that associated with other factors? Okay. So same gender marriage, cohabitation is incre increasing. But again, are there still some social taboos? Is there still stigmatization of being pregnant without being married, to being a same-sex couple, to living with someone before getting married, to having more than one sexual partner? Okay, um, remarriages are increasing. It's more acceptable to be divorced and then get married again. Divorce rates are increasing. Um, Families with more socioeconomic status benefit from pairing, and this is a big part of your book, is that your book starts talking about also the economics of the family and the family institution, and that does it give you an advantage to have two-parent working households versus being a single parent. So as you're starting to see the rise of single parents as a new form of family type diversity, <clears throat> how is that associated with your socioeconomic status, and then how does that affect your children? Is there a culture of poverty that's associated with single parenting? You know, some really deep questions come out of this chapter. Um, the book talks about how people that are single tend to have lower wages than people that have two 
uh, working incomes because, again, having two people often results in higher socioeconomic status for the overall family. And then when we're talking about socioeconomic status, meaning your access to life chances and opportunities such as education and jobs and wealth and social and cultural capital, how does having another person working with you as a partner you know, help you be able to get ahead in life, better access to health care, better access to nice neighborhoods and cars and things along those lines. So again, we're just seeing just so much social change going on. And as a result, we have all these new groups that we have to consider the effects, you know, of different variables in society. And so when we're talking about family types, we have single parents, we have polyamorous families, we have same-sex couples, we have heterosex couples, we have divorced parents that are remarried, divorced parents that aren't remarried but are living together with all the children. And so then we have to ask all these questions like how are we all bonded? How is this associated with our social interaction? How is this associated with the meanings we attach to family? And so just some really great questions. Uh, but again, the major social changes are increased cohabitating, higher divorce rates, higher remarriage rates, major cultural changes when it comes to ideologies about social norms relating to gender identity and sexuality and sexual, well, you know, what's acceptable in modern times, really just cultural norms have been challenged in general, uh, changing in the laws, changing in state policies, the rise of individualism, the rise of women's rights, you know, four out of 10 women have a baby while not being married. That is completely new. Um, is it still a taboo? Why are women having children without being married? Is it easier for them in modern times because of women's rights so they're no longer dependent on a man? Just really great questions in this. And then, of course, the all of these ideas then culminate into our modern identities. Our identity uh, regarding our statuses within groups and then how our status within those groups are then associated with psychological factors such as like self-esteem and, and then sociological factors such as socioeconomic status. So again, a lot of stuff to talk about with this chapter. Uh, the book introduces who gets marriage, who gets married. Again, marriage rates have been declining in general since the 1960s. People are waiting until they're older. Many people choose not even to marry in modern times. Uh, the book talks about how race is associated with whether you marry. Uh, for example, people that are white are more likely to marry than people that are black. And then we have to get into all those reasons. And then if you really want to get into those reasons, you really have to look at economics and poverty and how races were subjugated into the lower classes. And what's the association between poverty and the family and then poverty and being a single parent versus not being in poverty and having a two parent families. So again, a lot of stuff to cover in this chapter. Uh, but again, it all boils down to higher socioeconomic status makes you more likely to marry. It's also associated with age. Again, people with college degrees are more likely to marry than people with no to college degrees. And again, getting a college degree has then associated with whether or not you are in poverty. So really the ultimate theme that's going on here is as poverty decreases, marriage rates increase. And so what happens when you stick entire races into poverty? How is that associated with marriage rates? And is that marriage rate associated with whether or not that person in poverty got a good educational attainment to get a good job, to get wealth? And so again, what's the association between wealth, education, the family, and who gets married and things along those lines? And a lot of that just simply has to do with the culture of poverty. Um, why are people delaying marriage, having less babies? Why are we waiting? Is it access to birth control? Is it ideology? Are people just choosing not to have as many kids anymore? Do we not need as many kids anymore because you don't look at the family and children as economical value? So people want to have maybe they want to have less children because investing in 10, they don't have as much time for as they would if they just invested in two. And so the average you know family is having about two children, which is then reducing the overall birth rate. Um, attitudes toward marriage have changed over time. Again, is it taboo to not be married in modern times? Uh, dating norms have changed over time. Economics have changed over time where women now have access to being able to compete in the class system, which is raising the socioeconomic status of women, which is resulting in them having more power over their lives than ever before in the United States. 
And so again, how was women's rights associated with women rising up the social class ladder? And then how did women rising up the social class ladder, how is that associated with whether or not they're getting married, whether they need to get married, how many children women are having? Because again, if women are getting more education and they're staying in college longer and they're waiting to have children until after college and then they're having less children in general, you know, how much of that is simply due to women's rights and economics? So that's why I love sociology is because we have so many variables floating around right now. We're talking about the effect of poverty on the family and whether or not you get married. We're talking about women's rights and how that's associated with, you know, poverty and whether or not you get married. Because again, as women's rights increases, the culture of poverty for for, uh, for females goes down and so more women are getting out of poverty which is increasing their overall social status and so you know how is this influencing family dynamics and then if more women are getting an education and getting jobs then how is that affecting whether or not men are then leaving the workforce to go home and stay at the family or is it just a rise in two-parent working households where both men and women are now working because it's more expensive in modern times to survive. So again, so many cool themes floating around right now. But again, why get married in modern times? Is it sexuality norms? Is that pressure that, you know, is there a negative stereotype attached to having sex outside of marriage, for example? Is it for love? Are you just in love? Is it, and I love how your book talks about same-sex marriage as an affirmation of love because really, you know, it's, it's, it's about so many, it's just the big core of that. It's just, you know, that's why they fought for it for so long is so they can just have that recognition of love. And I love that your book talks about that. Uh, is it economics? Like, is there benefits to being married? Is it just because you would like a companion? Is it because you believe in commitment and monogamy? Is it the incentives attached to being married, not only the brain benefits and the health benefits, but the companion benefits, etc.? Is it social pressure that society and your family and your peers and the other agents of socialization expect you to get married? Is it imitation, like you're kind of imposed upon you? Who marries whom? Again, the book talks about the economics of marriage and it applies market principles to marriage, which at first I kind of scoffed at. Like, how can we just apply economics to marriage? You know, and is it really like a, a benefit cost scenario, an assessment of the quality of marriage? You know, but maybe there's something to it. So your book talks about that. So I brought up a slide on it anyhow. But, you know, it looks at the marriage uh, it talks about, you know, the marriage market and it says, you know, we put ourselves out to market. We go out, we go out into society, we interact, we seek out what we want. We do a cost benefit analysis. We weigh whether we want to be with that person. We ask a lot of questions. We see if they meet all of our checklists, you know, do they have the right culture, socioeconomic status, religion, are they funny, are they cute, you know, all of those factors, right? Can you talk to them about stuff? Can you share feelings? <laughs> Who knows what it is? And all of us have our own market principles, the things that we deem are valuable. And so then we seek out what is valuable. And then your book distinguishes between endogamy, which is marrying within groups, and exogamy, or marrying outside of groups. And so, <clears throat> you know, how much of this endogamous ideology of you know the expectation to marry people within your group and are you even exposed to people outside of your group is associated with who you end up marrying and then one of the common ideas about marriage is you know you marry someone five miles from where you live you know and so it makes you kind of question soulmate if you know the main reason people get married is because they you know were close enough to actually meet <laughs> you know and so some really good questions so you know who's out there in the marriage market and what does your market consist of is usually your exposure and what you're able to gain access to, okay? Uh, when it comes to race and ethnicity, you've had an incredible rise of interracial marriages. In 1980, there were only about 400,000 interracial marriages, but now in modern times, there's over 10 million. However, race and ethnicity is still associated with who you marry because of segregation in society. And so when you look at racial and ethnic segregation in America that was historically racist, um, you, you saw that, you know, your social group, your towns, your neighborhood are, have been and still continue to be quite segregated in modern times. And so, again, is your world open enough where you're able to, you know, explore multiple different groups, multiple different statuses and being able to pick and choose from different things? Or, you know, are you only exposed to an endogamous group? Okay. 
uh, education levels associated with who gets married. You know, people of similar education levels tend to get married. People of social class positions that are similar, similar religions, uh, similar sexual orientations. And again, um, most relationships tend to be heterosexual. The book says less than 1% are non-heterosexual. But again, you're starting to see where people were not allowed to identify as not heterosexual previously. And so this number is going to dramatically grow up as it starts to balance out for the continuum of sexuality. And you could estimate that probably 5% of people identify as homosexual. And then is that an, an ability to be public about it or would it be higher if it was more private? And so it's interesting to see how this number is going to change over time. But again, the idea of marriage and being non-heterosexual just now got opened the door like five years ago. And so you're going to see this dramatic rise in this level as it should be, as it naturally balances out with the natural sexuality of humanity. Uh, you have a rise in cohabitation where you have sexual or romantic couples living together. Again, this was historically very taboo, but now in modern times, whether it's because of economics, whether it's because people are waiting longer before they get married, whether it's because it's acceptable to have sex while you're not married, the rise in cohabitation is becoming the new normal. And then cohabitation, of course, happens outside of marriage. But I like how your book distinguishes that cohabitation can happen before marriage instead of getting married or after you've been divorced and you're not remarried yet. OK, and now the cohabitation is what the book calls an expected stage for the majority of couples in modern times across all education levels. So this idea of cohabitation is becoming the new norm is very intriguing. And then we have to start looking at, you know, how is cohabitation associated with marriage rates and whether people get married? Is cohabitation associated with healthy and positive marriages? Is it associated with divorces? So we're going to have to start doing some new studies to really start to examine some of these new social trend changes. Um, lower socioeconomic status tends to increase family instability. So when you have single parent households, do they have as much ability to have higher socioeconomic status? And then if people are cohabitating and it's not a stable relationship, how is that affecting people's socioeconomic status? And so your book addresses some of these really interesting ideas. And it starts to talk about like what happens if you have a person who has multiple partners. So it's but it's kind of unstable. And so you're not getting the benefits of the two, you know, two person you know household with that higher socioeconomic status level and so again you know point some fingers at are there some problems associated with cohabitation that are very interesting to look at also um, so a series of changes in family structures has occurred um, we've had some conflict as a result and so we have to start asking questions you know how does Cohabitation affect the family? Does it create a stable family type? How does single parenting affect the family type? How does divorce and remarriage affect the family type? So a lot of good questions. And, you know, some of this can be associated with positive, but also some can be associated with stressors. Uh, so the modern married individual, the philosophy of love and relationships, soulmates, the identity of who we are, lifelong commitment, personal choice that is expected of everyone, love, romantic stories, to fulfill goals, raise children, be happy, success, emotional support, security. Again, these are all just ideas for why someone get married in modern times. Are you getting married for love? You know, is it just like that's what you believe in? Is it romantic stories that you feel like that's what you're supposed to do with your life? Is it to raise children? Are you happier with someone? You know, just really cool questions in modern times that maybe we're able to ask more than we could in the past, for example. The benefits of marriage, you have incredible brain rewards. And when I teach psychology, it's really interesting to talk about how monogamous relationships are associated with more brain rewards over time. So when you talk about sexuality, you know, humans are capable of having random hookups of being with multiple people or just being with one people. And you have brain rewards built in for all of those. But if you look at it over time, you know, your brain rewards from being in monogamous relationships far exceed those from having even like, you know, 50 or 100 partners and you loving every moment of it. 
And so again, your brain kind of has this built in where you're capable of many things, but there is something to monogamy. Because again, how many different needs does it fulfill? Not only your sexual needs, but your attachment needs. And also working together can take care of like food and survival and water and shelter and taking care of the kids and all these other benefits of working with somebody else or even multiple people, okay? It's associated with happiness. Um, so, you know, depending on the relationship, hence the word I put in depending in here, dependent, because some relationships are not healthy. And that can be associated with a major decline in happiness for various reasons, just not getting along, abuse, things along those lines to the dark sides. Um, but in general, the book states that people are more happy when they're married. Uh, health and wealth, again, is associated with marriage. Uh, responsibility, you know, giving your life a sense of purpose, that the fulfilling attachment, being socially integrated, you know, because you have someone to interact with. Humans need other humans. Babies do not develop without interaction. They need to be social as part of all of us. And we can't deny that even if we want to pretend like we don't need people, we still do. Again, cooperation, the status associated with it. You know, there's a lot of interesting benefits. Uh, the politics of marriage. Again, when we look into beyond the cultural statuses and the philosophical reasons for why we're getting married and the trends, again, we have to look at how politics got involved. And your book talks again about the Civil War and the you know government really jumped in on that so that it could take care of the widows to get people to fight. And that was kind of the, really the beginning of the government getting in the state, getting involved and actually legally defining relationships. But again, so you have the legitimacy of relationships that can be legitimized culturally, but also legally, especially when it comes to property and children. Because again, who has ownership of the kids in a, you know, in an unmarried situation? Is it the person that bore the children? Does the other person that made the child have rights to that child? Just some really good questions. Um, again, Women were historically property of the father and husband. And then in modern times, it doesn't work like that. Okay, modern times, women have a choice. Okay, it's not this restrictive as sexist environment as it used to be. And I love how the book talks about, you know, why would a woman need to take a male's name? And then how does that, you know, affect it? And why do we take the male's name? And how is the male's name associated with all these legally supporting of patriarchy? And then how can we make society less patriarchal, more equitable, more egalitarian, okay? So the government interventions, do they work when it comes to tax breaks and family assistance and things like that? You know, there's a lot to it that the government gets involved in. And again, marriage rights over the decades, we've been, you know, it's a major policy over time. Things are constantly changing. Again, it's a, a free world where people are pretty much able to do whatever they want now that they couldn't historically do before. And so it's an interesting time to be around. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful day.